We now move to questions to the Development Minister. And I call Raymond McCartney. Mr. McCartney. Question ever a hand there, I hope. Um, I have stated a number of times now that the need for social housing in both communities in the North Belfast constituency is roughly the same. That is not my view or interpretation of the figures. It is the case that the facts speak for themselves. The figures are for the, uh, are the housing executive's own figures and they are based on housing waiting list figures for the North Belfast Assembly and Parliamentary constituency. They are the housing executive's totals for the number of applicants for social housing who self-identified as either Protestant or Roman Catholic within each common landlord area in the constituency. The latest figures I have received from the housing executive, and they are from the end of December 2013, again speak for themselves. With 1,994 Protestants and 1,988 Roman Catholics on the waiting list in the North Belfast constituency. So the figures are very clear that the need in terms of the waiting list in North Belfast is roughly the same in terms of both the Protestant and Roman Catholic constituencies. And that is very different, of course, from the impression that has often been given in the past that there is some huge differential. Those are the executive's own figures that they have produced and provided to me. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer, where you have provided us with statistics. You haven't given us the basis on which the analysis was carried out. Could you provide us with that? What was the process of analysis that led you to that conclusion? Well, everyone who goes in to uh, register for social housing self-identifies as either Protestant or Roman Catholic or there are various other categories which are, can be grouped together as other, where people do not designate it as one or the other. The Housing Executive has detailed figures for every common landlord area across Northern Ireland. They have simply taken the figures for the common landlord areas in North Belfast, totaled those figures for both those who self-identified as Protestant and for those who self-identified as Roman Catholic. And the figures they came up with are, as I said, 1,994 people self-identified as Protestant and 1,988 identified as Roman Catholic. There is, of course, the issue of people who do not identify as one or the other. And you can go through a process of trying to uh, put those people into one category or the other, which would be contrary to what they themselves want. But even if you do that, and you assume, for example, that if a person puts down as, say, Ardoin, that they are probably from the Roman Catholic community, and if you put down Woodville, you're probably from the Protestant community. Even when you do that, it doesn't change the balance between them. The figures still work out roughly the same. But those are the figures for those who have self-identified. All you would do by designating people in a way that they themselves haven't done is to increase the figures, but it wouldn't actually change the balance. So the suggestion, I read it again this morning in the Irish News from someone uh, in the SDLP, that there is discrimination and differential. The figures there speak for themselves. 1,994 people from the Protestant community, 1,988 from the Roman Catholic community, a difference of six. Paula Bradley. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister uh, yet again for pointing out those figures of housing need in North Belfast? And can I ask the Minister, in his opinion, how has the obvious lack of focus on dereliction and decay in certain housing stock over the years led to the breakdown of our communities? Um, the member makes a very important point there because the role of the Department for Social Development does not simply include housing but also includes regeneration. And we have a number of areas with high levels of dereliction and decay, with empty houses boarded up, and these drag communities down. They become magnets for antisocial behaviour and for dumping. They blight the lives of the residents, creating despair and they are a lost opportunity. 
In the past, the solution to these problems was to bulldoze the empty properties, clear the site and walk away. As I've said before, a bulldozer and a packet of grass seed doesn't solve the problem. Building successful communities is therefore a new initiative which is part of the Facing the Future housing strategy for Northern Ireland and that aims to use housing intervention as one of the main catalysts for local regeneration. Six pilot areas have been selected to take forward this new initiative. The areas meet the criteria for selection as detailed in the housing strategy. All are already designated areas of deprivation but critically have good potential for recovery with available land or properties that can be refurbished. And I'm pleased that, for example, in Lower Old Park, the first group of houses that have been refurbished have now all been allocated and are fully occupied. Owen McGuinness. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, at first, I thought, Mr. Speaker, that the Minister uh, was simply spinning. But now I believe the Minister is also <clears throat> self-delusional in relation to uh, housing in North Belfast. But irrespective of whatever spin or self-delusion he indulges in, there is a basic need for housing in North Belfast. Will the, minister, will, the minister, will the Minister properly address that need and urgently? Well, first of all, if I could deal with the Member's point that I am self-delusional. Um, the figures that I quoted, figures that I quoted were in fact produced by the housing executive. They are not my figures. I didn't create them, I didn't write them. They were given to me this morning by the housing executive. Now if the member thinks that the housing executive is delusional, that is his opinion, he is entitled to that, but he cannot get round the fact that these are the figures. May not be the figures he wants to hear, may not be the figures he heard in the past, but they are the facts. And the reason behind this is very simple. In the North Belfast constituency, that constituency embraces all or part of four different housing areas. Shankill, North Belfast, Newton Abbey 1 and Newton Abbey 2. What has happened in the past is that certain people trying to manufacture figures took part of the constituency, which is predominantly Catholic and nationalist, and ignored the figures for the other parts of the constituency, which are predominantly unionist and Protestant. What the housing executive has done is to take the figures for the entire constituency, treating everybody equally and fairly, including people from both communities equally and fairly, not being partisan or partial or biased in any way, but in the entire constituency, these are the figures. The figures that were previously quoted excluded people who lived in Rathcool, people who lived in Woodville, people who lived in Rush Park, people who lived in Rathburn, people who lived in Queen's Park. Those communities are as much entitled to have their housing needs met as any other. I believe in fairness, equality and equity for everyone. Jim Allister. Mr Allister. Two. The member is well aware, I'm sure, that the negotiations in this matter are ongoing. And we must ensure that the housing executive's ability to conclude the negotiations successfully is not compromised in any way, particularly by talking about the negotiations openly here in the chamber. The details of the negotiation remain commercially sensitive, and it would not be appropriate to comment further until these are concluded. The housing executive has advised me that they continue to explore the issues with the contractors and their assessment is that a settlement is possible. The housing executive's board has assured me that it wants this resolved as soon as possible and that they will continue to strive towards that outcome. Jim Allister. From what the minister now knows, does he accept that his enthusiastic announcement of an £18 million pound overcharge was a gross exaggeration and did gross damage to contractors and their credit standing. Does he now accept that? Well, similar question was asked last time, and I'll give the answer which I give on each occasion. 
I did not invent the figure of £18 million in relation to the overestimated, uh, estimated overpayments to contractors. I was advised of the figure by the Chairman of the Board following a report to the Board of the Housing Executive in May 2013. The Campbell to Kell report estimated the sum of overcharging was in the region of £9 to £13 million. Pounds. And I have already stated that whilst that remained a substantial amount of taxpayers' money, I was somewhat relieved that the level had slightly reduced. However, at the end of the day, I have already stated clearly this afternoon, we must all await the outcome of the current negotiations, and I am hopeful that we are coming to the point where those negotiations will be concluded and a settlement between the housing executive and the contractors will have been reached. Until that point, we must leave the matter with the housing executive. Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Um, and I, I appreciate the Minister's uh, steer in this in terms of the confidentiality, in terms of where these negotiations are currently. However, maybe, and given that there was two reports in terms of the Campbell Tickell report, there was the draft report and there was the main report, and let's talk about the main report because it is in the public domain. Um, could the uh, Minister maybe outline some of the other findings that was in that actual, actual report? Um, thank the member for that question, which is an important one because. Um, the, the key thing in all of this is to learn lessons that will ensure that never again do we have the sort of problems that the housing executive has had with its contracts and the management of those contracts over a period of time. Shortcomings in management and governance within the housing executive have led to a situation where there have been substantial overpayments to contractors on planned maintenance contracts. Secondly, it found a lack of understanding and implementation of a new form of partnering contracts was the root cause of the failings. Thirdly, it found that the current situation appears to have improved but is still not yet fully satisfactory. It found no evidence of fraud or corruption. And finally, in order to remedy the situation, a wide-ranging programme of change and transformation is required. And I'm pleased to say that under uh, the leadership of the Chairman of the Housing Executive, we are now seeing that action plan put into place and implemented to ensure that the sort of uh, mismanagement of contracts, which existed over quite a number of years, but which I recognised when I came into the Department, uh, that that is now being addressed to make sure it does not happen again. John Dallet. Uh, Mr Speaker, the uh, Minister refuses to confirm that there wasn't a significant overcharge. Would he agree with the House, in fact, that there were significant undercharges? And really, at this stage, would the Minister consider parking the ministerial car and perhaps giving the briefcase to someone else? Pathetic. Pathetic. Order. I don't know whether the member concerned has problem in hearing answers or a problem in understanding them. But clearly he didn't get the point which I made a short time ago. That it would be utterly irresponsible, utterly irresponsible of people in this House, from whatever side of the chamber, to interfere in this in a way which would compromise, as I've already stated, what are delicate negotiations to reach a settlement between the housing executive and the contractors. And until we've got to that point, when the matter has been concluded, I think the least or the less that's said, the better. Because it's important that we get the best outcome for the public purse uh, and ensure that uh, this matter is resolved satisfactorily all round. Um, I simply say to the member that um, there's a need there for a little bit of patience. This is a matter that is with the housing executive. They're dealing with it. They're negotiating. We should leave them to get on with that in commercial confidence. Fry McCann, we have still members who seem to have a difficulty in rising in their places for whatever reason. Mr McCann. I have to say, Chair, I was up that often. I was getting dizzy. But, uh, I've got a young Kulia. And uh, can the Minister confirm of all the contractors he's referred to in this House have already been allocated or about to be allocated new contracts? Um, the contracts uh, for planned maintenance have not been awarded as yet because, as is well known, uh, the, the matter is tied in with this fact of um, getting a resolution with the contractors. So no planned maintenance contracts have been awarded. 
And that's one of the difficulties that we have faced in the executive face, because when you haven't awarded the contracts, any work that was in the system has basically been more or less used up, and therefore you create a situation where uh, there's an underspend. But it's important that we get this matter satisfactorily resolved. Um, I would say to, to, to the member um, that I would encourage people to be just that little bit patient until we get a resolution. As regards companies being given other contracts that were not planned maintenance contracts, um, there is no technical or legal way in which people can be barred from being given contracts because whatever questions might remain, um, there, there is no legal basis for that. Uh, those contracts, uh, for example, the, the contracts have been awarded as regards to the double glazing. Um, but you know, this is something that has to happen. It, it doesn't resolve the situation of how we sort out what was there in the past, which was a mess, let's be honest about it. Over quite a number of years, the handling of contracts by the housing executive was really unacceptable. Management, well, people ask who the minister was indeed. Um, that's a question that people might well ask. Uh, but it's important anyway. Order. Order. Well, Order. He doesn't have a car to give up now. Fear. Cash over three, question three, please. The statutory minimum fitness standard requires all dwellings to be structurally stable, to be free from serious disrepair, and make adequate provision for lighting, heating, bathing, and the preparation of food. My officials are currently examining options to identify how the current minimum standard for housing across all tenures can be most effectively enhanced. Work is progressing in line with the Housing Strategy Action Plan. And as such, I expect to launch a consultation on the introduction of an enhanced standard in the coming year. The consultation will provide an opportunity for all stakeholders to formally submit their views on the future of the standard. And any enhanced statutory fitness standard will apply across all housing tenures, including uh, the private rented sector. Megan Fear. Uh, I would and thank the Minister for his answer. Um, there was a Savile re uh, report out a few years ago which said that the housing executive houses were of a very, very high standard. Can I just ask this Minister to agree that that standard needs to be maintained and investment is required for it? Um, yes, I, I, I welcome that question because that is um, an issue that I feel very passionately about, that we need to maintain the standard of our social housing stock. In fact, there has been very, very substantial underinvestment in our social housing stock in recent years. And I'm not going to go down the road here of asking for people to get briefcases or ministerial cars on their way out. I'm going to simply point out the evidence is clearly there that there hasn't been the level of investment by the housing executive that there should have been. Um, and that's why we have issues such as the uh, thousands of properties which have no cavity wall insulation which I, I've identified as a major issue which we're making real progress on at the moment in terms of getting the right technical approach to deal with that. That's why when I came into the department we had to initiate the, the double glazing program because initially the executive was saying this would take 10 years to do and I said no, that's unacceptable. We'll have that done within the term of this assembly <coughs> and it will be done by um, May 2015. So in just over a year that whole piece of work will have been completed. So those are the sort of issues about uh, double glazing and also in regard to, um, to um, the, the insulation. And can I say also that the executive is also doing a piece of work at the moment looking at uh, all of its stock in terms of energy efficiency. So these are the sort of, yes, there is a substantial amount of work to be done. It's important that that is kept up. I regret that significant numbers of tenants were left for a long period of time in properties which, because of the lack, particularly of uh, insulation, um, are not of, of the sort of standard that we would expect today. Adrian McQuillan. Mr. Mr. Speaker, can I thank the Minister for his answer so far, but can I ask the Minister how does the levels of fitness between urban and rural properties compare? Um, the, the point that the member makes there is an interesting one, um, in that the, the House Condition Survey indicates that 60% of unfit dwellings are located in rural areas. And this is largely attributable to the higher vacancy rates amongst these uh, properties. 
My department recognises the importance of rural areas as places to live and work and aims to create a living countryside with strong, vibrant communities. To that end, last May I launched the Housing Executive's latest Rural Housing Action Plan. And that plan is designed to ensure that rural areas get their fair share of available resources and will help to reduce unfitness rates outside of our urban areas. Overall, across Northern Ireland, the uh, unfitness level of the housing stock stands at 4.6%. However, when vacant dwellings are removed from consideration, that figure drops to 1%, the lowest figure to date. But there is a, a higher level of empty properties, vacant properties in rural areas, and therefore the figure does appear to be higher. Uh, Mr. Speaker, uh, Minister, thank you for your answer thus far. Uh, given any uh, minimum standard for fitness of property, how will you ensure that the private rented sector is adequately dealt with in, the, in, in this matter as the largest growing sector, uh, particularly with regards to fitness of property, heating and various other aspects, because the private rented sector is sometimes among the worst of properties? Well, uh, as, I, as I pointed out there in my initial answer, um, any enhanced statutory fitness standard will apply across all housing tenures, including the private rented sector. Um, I think it's important that we look on the private rented sector as a significant provider of accommodation. Uh, and that's why the tenancy deposit scheme was brought in to make it a more attractive option. And also why landlord registration is now underway, because um, all of those things are small steps. Um, it's an area which I think was maybe neglected in the past by others. I want to make sure that we take the right interventions, and um, I think those are our starts. Um, the point about uh, the, the landlord registration uh, is, of course, that um, if we have direct payments to landlords, um, it will be in the future in the interest of landlords uh, to be on the register. Cindy Anderson, Mr. Anderson. I say four, Mr. Speaker. Um, having visited both the states, I've witnessed, it, I've witnessed at first hand the issues of concern. My department is already to the fore in taking forward work to endeavour to address the issues there, and both the states have benefited from a number of opportunities to tackle social deprivation. On both the states, the Housing Executive has undertaken a very comprehensive multi-element improvement programme and a working group has been established with the PSNI, Craig Alvin Borough Council and the Police and Community Partnership to help tackle antisocial behaviour. In addition, the Corcoran Redmondville Community Partnership received community support programme funding totalling some £2,689, uh, which was awarded in 2013-14. I think they were going to do maybe better than they thought there for a moment. Um, the CSP is a unique and collaborative initiative involving DSD, the 26 district councils, local community and voluntary groups and local advice organisations and aims to strengthen local communities, increase community participation and promote social inclusion through the stimulation and support of community groups, community activity and advice services. My department's SPOD scheme, which aims to drive physical, economic, social and community renewal, and improving living conditions at a small scale is in its final year and provides the potential to further direct regeneration funding. And I will be considering whether there is any scope to consider a bid from Corcoran and Redmond Estates. And the Northern Ireland Executive has agreed to transfer a range of powers to the 11 new councils from April 2015, enabling local councils to take responsibility for community development and regeneration, including tackling social deprivation. But in the meantime, I intend to meet with David Simpson, MP for the area, to explore further opportunities to tackle social deprivation in these estates in the period up to April 2015, and I look forward uh, to that meeting. Sydney Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for that very detailed response. I certainly appreciate some of the comments that's coming forward here today. And uh, can I also thank him for taking the time to visit the Cork train and Redmondville uh, uh, estates in Portadown. Minister, as you are aware, that those two estates fall outside the neighbourhood renewal area, and as such they find it very difficult uh, well, indeed, to attract funding. Can I ask the Minister what investment his department has already made in these areas? Thank you. 
Uh, the, the member is absolutely correct in saying that they, they do fall outside the boundary of the neighbourhood renewal areas. Um, however, the housing stock, uh, the housing sector has invested £2.6 million in improving their housing stock in those uh, two estates of Corcoran and Redmondville. Gas heating in 2011, £1.1 million, an ECM scheme in 2011 at a cost of £266,000. Some properties in Redmondville received new kitchens last year at a cost of £266,000 and uh, UPVC windows in both estates in 2012 at a total cost of £968,000. Three blocks of flats, approximately 30 in total, were passed to the South Ulster Housing Association in the 1990s and are currently included in that association's 2014-15 ECM uh, programme for the spring-summer of this year. I was also pleased to note that a play park at Corcoran Road was provided and is being maintained by Craig Avon Borough Council and the Housing Executive is aware of ongoing discussions between local residents and the Council about the future of the park and a potential upgrade scheme. And uh, just to refer back to the initial answer, my department's SPOD scheme has some potential I think there and we will be considering very soon whether there is any scope to consider a bid from Corcoran and Redmond Estates to the SPOD scheme. Dolores Kelly, Mrs. Kelly. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I welcome any investment in areas of uh, deprivation. Uh, and as the Minister stated, uh, those areas fall outside of the neighbourhood renewal area. So then, Minister, how are you ensuring equity across all of the areas in relation to investment and, and tackling social deprivation? Well, the schemes that I inherited from my predecessors in the Members' Own Party um, were schemes that uh, were based around neighbourhood renewal, areas at risk and of course then, then spawn. Um, the figures that, or, or the, the, the resources that have been put out through neighbourhood renewal in the period when I've been in the department are very much the same overall as under uh, predecessor ministers. So if there's any criticism of what I've done in that regard, it's a criticism that would rebound on certain other predecessors. Um, however, um, <laughs> However, uh, I, I do think that it is important that we keep these issues under review, and that's why we brought in, for example, uh, a neighbourhood renewal, uh, some guidance as to how neighbourhood renewal partnerships should function. Um, we've also tried to see what is good practice, so it's not just simply the amount of money that you put in, it's the value that you get out of it as well. And um, I think there are lessons that some neighbourhood renewal areas could learn from others, hence the guidance. And, um, Moving forward into the future, in the longer term, of course, councils locally may decide to abandon neighbourhood renewal and go on a different line because um, the, the, the focusing on the top 10% does create a difficulty in that over a period of years, areas that were in stayed in, areas that were out were left out, and the result was that uh, some areas have fallen significantly. They were maybe just outside it before, they're maybe now actually within the 10%, but because the boundaries were set previously, uh, they haven't been included. That's something that also needs to be reviewed. So there's quite a bit of work to be done there to get a system that really fit for purpose. Sam Gardner. Mr Gardner. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Can the Minister tell us the progress that has been made on narrowing the gap uh, outside? Uh, the outcome indicates within neighbourhood renewal between Corcoran and Redmondville and the rest of Northern Ireland. That question is really a question of what are the figures for that particular area as compared to other areas. Um, I don't have those detailed figures to hand, um, but I mean we can get some figures uh, in relation to that estate, uh, and I would hope that uh, the, the small pockets of deprivation will, will certainly um, make, it, make a difference. The, the member said, I think the question was, narrowing the gap between that area and other areas in Northern Ireland. The, the, the core point here is that a neighbourhood renewal area is one that is in the top 10%, then down below that the areas at risk. Um, we need to check back on particular estates where they sit at the moment, but uh, I'm happy to do that and, and come back to the member. Order members, that includes all questions to the minister. We now move on to topical questions to the minister, and I call Ian McRae. Uh, Mr McRae. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Could the Minister share his views on the recent statements made by church leaders in Great Britain regarding the implementation of welfare reform? Um, 
Recently, there were a number of statements made in regard to welfare reform from uh, Great Britain. Uh, the Archbishop of Westminster, the, the Roman Catholic Archbishop, and I understand incoming Cardinal, commented on welfare reform in an interview with the Daily Telegraph on the 14th of February. And we also had uh, an open letter sent to the Prime Minister on the 19th of February from uh, 26 Church of England bishops in relation to um, changes in welfare reform. Um, Actually, uh, many of the points that they made were points that I wouldn't really disagree with. And interestingly enough, I noticed even a, a, a Conservative MP on uh, a television panel programme the other night saying that there were many of the things that they said that he agreed with uh, as well. And I think it is, first of all, good to say that it is a valuable thing, I think, that civic and religious leaders engage on important social and economic issues, such as welfare reform, uh, and that we should listen carefully to what's being said. Um, much of the point that they made, um, I, I think, have some validity. Um, and it's also important to say that we're not necessarily doing things exactly or intending to do things um, in Northern Ireland in exactly the same way as Great Britain. I think we're actually doing things better in Northern Ireland than uh, across the water. What they were talking about was, I think, the fact that the welfare system should be there as a safety net for those who are particularly vulnerable, for those who uh, find it impossible to, because of a disability, an illness or whatever, to secure work, or in an area where there is not work available. And we all agree with that, that it is important that there is uh, a safety net there for some of the um, most vulnerable people. And I would hope that as we move forward in Northern Ireland, that that will also be uh, the case here. It should be the priority, I think, for all of us. Could I say also, I've met with a number of groups uh, from the faith sector in Northern Ireland, including the four church four main church leaders uh, to talk about these things and uh, I think that that's something we'll want to continue with. Ian McRae. In, in light of the, the Minister's answer and indeed the statements made by the church leaders, can the Minister outline how he sees Northern Ireland implementing these changes and can he see it being any differently to what's been said? Um, there are two things I think I would pick out in particular. Uh, in answer to that question. For many years, the social fund has been the uh, social security benefit of last resort for the most vulnerable people in our society, ensuring that they're not left in a position of hunger or destitution. And I recognise the need to put in place a new discretionary support scheme to replace the current social fund, which will be available across Northern Ireland. So I secured funding for the scheme from the Treasury and plan to extend it so that it is available not only to people in receipt of benefits, but also to low-paid working families who often have lost out in the past. And that extension to the low-paid working families is something I think of real value. The new discretionary support scheme is only one example of where we can see devolution of social security working for the people of Northern Ireland by being able to do things differently from other parts of the United Kingdom. Uh, and I believe also that the package of measures which I have developed to shape how welfare reform might be implemented in Northern Ireland addresses many of the concerns raised by the church leaders. I suppose the other thing we've done with great uh, commitment here in Northern Ireland is in terms of maximising income from benefits. The benefit uptake campaign has been particularly successful. In fact, over the last few years, in some years, we've trebled the amount of money. It went up from um, about 1.4, 1.5 to about 5 million. We're now up to around the 15 million. And there will be further progress on that. So those are things that we are doing differently in Northern Ireland, and I think that's important. Question number two has been withdrawn. Alec Eason. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Could I ask the Minister for his assessment on the progress by the new Council's transition committees in the transfer of both urban regeneration and neighbourhood renewal to the new Councils through his department? Um, thank the Member for, for the question there. And I was assured by my officials that this uh, transfer or conferring of powers on uh, local government uh, authorities would be smooth and seamless. And that's hugely important that it is smooth and seamless. First of all, in terms of neighbourhood renewal and tackling deprivation, that we do not find some sort of cliff edge where there are difficulties arise at the transfer. Um, secondly, uh, the, the issue of the public realm schemes and some of the big urban regeneration schemes, which again not only benefit the town centres 
but also are hugely important to the construction industry uh, at a time when it has been under significant pressure. So it was important that these were smooth and seamless. You don't want to be in a position where a scheme starts and then falls into difficulty because of conferring powers on councils. Um, therefore, we conducted a gateway review of it from the department side to see how DSD was geared up for the changes. But there's the other side as well, the councils then. And we are moving into a period of real change. We'll have new councils. We'll have significant numbers of new councillors. With many councils, you will have new staff at a senior level dealing with these issues. And councils are taking on new, enhanced, additional responsibilities. It's not surprising, therefore, that um, there have been concerns expressed about changes in regard to neighbourhood renewal and urban regeneration um, and the fear that it will not be smooth and seamless. For that reason, I, I've been keeping a close watch on this and I have written to chairs of the transition committees um, regarding meeting with them to hear their views on where we are. Um, we're looking at the departmental side through the gateway review. We're talking to the transitional committee chairs, and then on the basis of that, we'll have a better idea of where this is, is going. Alec Eason. Does the Minister accept that these functions are key to the survival of our town centres and in tackling deprivation and economic inactivities in our communities across Northern Ireland? Um, I, I would agree entirely with that. As I said in answer to an earlier question today, regeneration is one of the main thrusts of the department. And if we look at those two areas of areas of disadvantage and deprivation and the town centres, it's important, hugely important, that this work proceeds smoothly and seamlessly and effectively. We don't want it to be disrupted in any way. In terms of our town centres, which are providers, significant providers in terms of employment, uh, as well as having a social value that's um, greatly valued. Uh, the, the town centres there um, are under real pressure for a whole range of reasons, economic climate, out-of-town shopping, uh, online shopping and so on. And the, the public realm schemes, the town centre master plans, have made a significant difference to many of those towns. Um, I think they make them much more attractive for people to come and shop, to socialise and so on there. And therefore, uh, from the point of view of the town centres, we need to keep this work moving smoothly. And then again, as I've said, tackling deprivation and low levels of uh, issues around employment. Um, the, the, the tackling deprivation work through neighbourhood renewal, etc. One of the focuses in there has to be on uh, increasing employability, making people ready for employment, supporting maybe a social enterprise which creates employment. All of these things uh, are, are uh, ways in which we help to address uh, levels of unemployment and increase levels of employability. So both in terms of town centres and the neighbourhood renewal work, these are hugely important aspects of what we do. Raymond McCartney, Mr McCartney. Mr. Cooler, uh, can I ask the Minister indeed, by, and, and by asking him, I'm, I'm greatly heartened by an earlier answer to Dean McRae that you share the concern of the senior church leaders in relation to welfare reform. But if we don't do it differently, then how can we expect the outcomes to be different? So could the Minister outline specifically what measures he feels that we can put in place to ensure that the outcomes are different? Um, this is a, a, an area where certain things are in the public domain officially <laughs> and certain things seem to be in the public domain unofficially. Um, but, uh, and, and certain other things seem to be bogged down um, because uh, there is an inability of some people in the Assembly uh, from one side of the chamber to face up to the challenge that we need to do things differently and move on doing them differently. Um, First of all, I indicated way back over a year ago that we had negotiated flexibilities in terms of Northern Ireland, in terms of um, direct payments to landlords, um, the issue around split payments where it was necessary, and the issue around um, fortnightly payments instead of monthly payments. So those were things that were identified at a very early stage when I was negotiating directly with DWP in London. Um, since then, there has been work ongoing, as the, the member will be aware, um, in my department, looking carefully at what other things need to be done differently. 
and there were conversations not just with London but also with the First Minister and the Deputy First Minister. And so by the summer of last year, by June of last year, I had a package of measures which I think goes a very long way to make the situation in Northern Ireland much better than it would be uh, across the water. Well, those uh, things are, um, have been tabled in the executive on a number of occasions, uh, but haven't quite managed to get through to discussion in the, in the uh, executive. Um, so it is difficult for me to spell out all of the detail, but um, I continue to have meetings in the hope that people will recognise that, first of all, if we don't move on this issue, we face a penalty, a levy from Westminster of £1 billion. And I don't want to be in a situation where we have to explain to people why, because of some people's intransigence, uh, we are taking £1 billion over a period of years out of uh, the budget for health or education or whatever. £1 billion is an awful lot of money to have taken out. Some people then suggest, well, we could do it differently. We could invent our own uh, or commission our own IT system. £1.62 billion. That would be another £1.62 on top of the £1 billion. And £2.62 billion in anybody's uh, finances is an awful lot of money to be taken off health, education, farming, deprivation, all of these areas that we're trying to work on. Um, I don't know where it's going to come from. Can I just remind the Minister of the two-minute rule? And I can understand sometimes Ministers need more time because of the nature of the question. Raymond McCartney. Uh, I've got to come because my kids wake us less than Eric Don Fragerson. Uh, can I thank the, the Speaker and the, thank the Minister for his detailed answer, which I think is appreciated. But if we are going to do things differently, which the Minister now accepts, then they have to be seen to be different. And the way they're going to seem to be different is in the lives of the vulnerable people whom we all represent. Given the caution of the senior church leaders from their experience in England, how can we satisfy ourselves, or how do we satisfy ourselves, that we are not signing up to something that will affect people in a devastating way? Um, that's why, because of those concerns, because I believe we have a responsibility to show compassion to people who are vulnerable, um, that's why I developed the package of measures and flexibilities and interventions that I did develop. Um, I think also it's important to bear in mind the impact not just of uh, the cost in terms of penalties and levies or the cost in terms of developing um, an IT system, um, but also the cost if we don't move forward on this. Because over the course of 2016, various groups of people in Northern Ireland who would be entitled, we would have thought, to receive certain benefits, will no longer be able to receive them. Because uh, the uh, Assembly of Northern Ireland will have failed to move ahead fast enough on this. Um, we need, from the rest of this year and next year, it will be the end of 2015, before we can get the legislation and the regulations through this Assembly. And that's very close to the point where um, the, the changes in terms of IT are such that people would cease to receive certain benefits. So HMRC benefits, for example, would no longer uh, be paid. Uh, and if you're saying to families in Northern Ireland, well, you could have a benefit, but we've faffed around, wasted so much time and talked so much uh, and procrastinated for so long that uh, you can't have that benefit. That would be the most appalling position to be in. And I don't know how the member opposite or others from his party could possibly explain that away to vulnerable people who would be suffering directly because of that procrastination. Thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Minister, you made reference to uh, the success of your department's work with regards to public realm activities. What actions will your department be taking with regards to paramilitary murals on the route of the Giro d'Italia? Well, the issue of uh, the route and what is not on the route or is on the route is one that uh, I do not have direct responsibility for. Um, there are, uh, I, I have to confess, I haven't pursued with a map the full detail of the route, but there are all sorts of um, pieces of paraphernalia murals and other things on all sorts of places that I'm sure um, 
members would prefer not to see there. On the other hand, there are murals which I find very pleasing, which are cultural and historical, uh, and which enrich our society. Uh, I mean, if you're talking about murals, I was even lobbied to have the restoration of one particular piece of graffiti there in East Belfast some time ago. There are some very attractive murals in East Belfast, um, telling of the football history, shipbuilding and other uh, aspects of it. Um, whether it be those on the route, or whether it be, um, whether it be the sort of situation where you have in Castle Derg with a, a paramilitary IRA memorial on uh, public property, or whether it be some of the paramilitary memorials, uh, in fact, at the site of roads, all of which I think understand are of republican nature. This is a problem that has been around for quite some time. I want us to see a position in Northern Ireland where we celebrate our culture, our heritage, and there's a long tradition of murals in Northern Ireland because um, they went back to, I think it was, I think the first ones went up about 1912. Um, the first murals appeared around that time, uh, and they were very fine ones, um, reflecting the Unionist perspective at that time. I think King William featured extensively in a number of them uh, at that time. But um, the issue about um, offensive uh, things, this is not a one-sided thing. Sometimes people seem to think it is. It's an issue on both communities that there are challenges. Um, and I, I would hope that uh, it's something that can be addressed over time. We've done a lot of work with re-imaging. And I've seen quite a number of murals um, in, in, in different areas replaced, paramilitary ones going Time and being replaced on. by much more acceptable ones. Order members, that includes.